happy to introduce uh, Ricardo Goodwin, Associate Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the State University of Campinas, Brazil. Excuse my pronunciation. Current interests in cognitive architectures, cognitive systems, intelligent systems, and the author of many books. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story about uh, episodes and how our cognition uh, used to grab and mount these episodes from the data that we acquire from, from our uh, sensory organs. Okay, so uh, in this work in particular, uh, we are be introducing the episode tracker module, which is a cognitive module to detect and track episodes happening at the environment surrounding a cognitive agent from its sensory data. So uh, this project is aimed as a part of uh, our effort to build what we call a cognitive system toolkit. The, the cognitive system toolkit is a long-term project that we have at University of Campinas, where we uh, are proposing both uh, a conceptual uh, a cognitive architecture and have the software for building this cognitive architecture that could be available for uh, equipping uh, cognitive agents, okay? Uh, and the idea is that this episode tracker module is going to be integrated later into this uh, cognitive system toolkit and then will be available for general episode tracking in cognitive systems that can be built with this uh, toolkit. Okay. Um, I have a, some concepts that I need to introduce and the uh, episode tracker module uh, they encode sensory data into what we call scene-based episode representations. I, am, I will be explaining in, in a few seconds the difference between what we call a scene-based episode representation and what we call also a state-based uh, episode representation. And uh, at some sense, what we are doing here with the episode tracker module is a kind of a technical implementation of uh, Baddeley's uh, episode, uh, uh, episodic buffer. Okay, I don't know what is this. Uh, no. Okay. So, uh, these episodes, they then, after they are created from sensory data, they can be used as a resource in many other different cognitive tasks like decision making, learning, or uh, storage in memory, or, or other kinds of possible use for uh, equipping our uh, intelligent agents to operate into an environment. Okay. Well, let's try to understand why this uh, artificial episodic memory is, is a relevant issue. Okay. Uh, episodic memory is an essential component of the human cognitive system. Uh, in terms of psychology, uh, the work of Tuvin describes episodic memory as a true marvel of nature. With episodic memory, one can re-experience previous events and use this knowledge to solve problems, make predictions, contextualize their present situation, and this could be used to enhance other cognitive capabilities that we as humans have in, in our decision-making operation, okay? So, for example, imagine that you are uh, searching for your car in a very large uh, parking lot, and, uh, well, how I can go to my car, I then try to rescue from my episodic memory, uh, the time that I parked the car and then I made other things, 
And tracking back this information that I, I rescue from uh, the episodic memory, I can try to figure out where my car is parked and then I can I trace a, a, a course for, for, for uh, looking for the car and going for where this car is, okay? So, uh, there are many people that are already using this uh, notion of episodic memory. For example, uh, Nuxo and Laird indicate several cognitive capabilities that an agent would benefit from episodic memory, for example, it can be used for action modeling, for decision making, for retroactive learning, for virtual sensing, and many other uh, possible uses, for example, for noticing significant uh, input, detecting the repetition of events or things that are happening many times, uh, for the, the modeling of environment, managing long-term goals, uh, it can be used, for, for example, for the sense of identity, my identity in some sense, comes from my capability of remembering where I have uh, been tomorrow morning, yesterday, and, and, and many other days before. Uh, it can be used for the reanalysis of uh, uh, some knowledge that is, is given to me. Uh, it can be used for explaining behavior. So it's uh, very important to have uh, this episodic representation available for being used in a cognitive architecture. And the interesting thing is that, well, even though people talk a lot about episodic memory, we don't see this in all the cognitive architectures. It's true that many cognitive architectures touch this issue of, of episodic memory, but usually in uh, not a, a so complete sense that we would like to, 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 to do here, okay? Uh, as I said, many people have already implemented some sort of episodic memory. For example, the work of Dodd and Gutierrez, the Kuputswami, Brom, Nuxo and Laird, uh, Blundell, Bocchinius, uh, Martin. So all these uh, references, they build some sort of episodic memory uh, to be used in a cognitive architecture. But most of these implementations, they use what we call state-based episodes. And I said to you that we want to build here not state-based episodes, but scene-based episodes. Let's try to understand the difference, okay? Uh, episode representation can be either state-based or scene-based. What is the difference between that? First, let's try to understand what is a state-based episode. A state-based episode is simply a sequence of an agent's internal states. For example, I have a cognitive architecture. This cognitive architecture is processing some internal states. And at each time, I start to store these states. Okay? And then now you have a timeline, which is a timeline uh, of uh, states. And I call it an episodic memory. Okay? Well, this is the simplest way of creating an episodic memory. I just store how these uh, states have been used by the architecture during the time, okay? This is uh, the, the standard way that people usually implement uh, episodic memory. So the pro for this is that it's easier to encode. You just need to store them. You can do that automatically, just like it's done, for example, in SOAR, okay? What is the cons? Well, there is a memory cost because if you just start storing everything, there is an explosion in, in consumption of memory. At some time, you cannot be just remembering everything. You need to implement some policy of uh, forgetting things, otherwise you're going to just fill up your memory, okay? And the biggest problem is that uh, using this kind of episodic memory, Usually, uh, it is difficult to operate in high-level mechanisms uh, of cognition, okay? like planning and reasoning. Why? Because this data is too much raw. Okay? It, 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 it's not interpretable. Okay? And this is the point that we need to introduce this that is called scene-based episodes. Scene-based episodes is more or less like we humans, we store our episodes, okay? 
Uh, in some sense, these scene-based episodes, they encode segments of space-time into a semantic representation that we call a scene. What is a scene? A scene is a high-level interpretation of what is going on the episode. It's a kind of an interpreted version of the state-based episodes that I, I told you later. Okay? In, instead of just remembering everything I provide an interpretation of this data, and I store as uh, episodes this interpreted version of the state-based episodes. Okay? The difference is that in a scene-based episode, we have high-level elements like objects, its properties, the actions that are happening uh, with these uh, objects. Okay? And so they are much more like what we do in our language. Okay? I can say for you, for example, an episode. Oh, the oven has uh, uh, coded. Okay? So the temperature of the oven was high, and after some time, it was low. Okay? I could just uh, store the temperature. Okay? This could be a kind of, of uh, episodic memory. But I don't have this high-level semantic interpretation of the episodes that I can have if I use objects and properties and uh, actions in order to understand what are those episodes. Well, the pros for this approach is that it saves memory storage because I don't need to store everything, okay? It interfaces well with these high-level cognitive functions, but there is a con. Uh, it requires complex perceptual mechanisms that interpret multidimensional sensory data to encode the conceptual information. So in order to have properties, objects, and actions, I need to have some pre-processing of data in order to discover those things and encode them into a specific kind of representation. Well, at this point, it will be important to provide you with the difference between an episodic memory and the episodic buffer. If you go to the literature on cognitive psychology, we will see that we have both uh, uh, ideas, both concepts. The episodic memory is a long-term declarative type of memory following Squire's taxonomy for long-term long memory systems that is in, in this uh, slide. Okay? And uh, Tuvin first proposed two separate declarative memory systems, which are mainly responsible for processing information about general facts and personally experienced events. The first one is what we call semantic memory. It stores what we understand as a, the answer to the question, what? Okay? And we have some knowledge like, uh, the university is next to the bakery. There is no time here, okay? But the second kind of knowledge is, uh, for example, I commuted yesterday from the bakery to the university. You can see that time is implicit here. There is something that is me, okay? I am commuting from one place to another place. I was at the bakery, um, and then I, I went to the university. And there is time changing my position in the environment, okay? And this is basically what is encoded into an episodic memory. Opposite to that, this concept of the episodic memory, we have this um, concept from Baddeley that uh, is uh, the idea of a working memory. Well, a working memory is a multi-component system with limited capacity that manages and stores information in the short term, and it's important to note this short term, in support of cognition and action. And basically, Baddeley have uh, these uh, three components controlled by this fourth, that is the central executive. So we have the phonological loop, the visual spatial sketchpad, and the episodic buffer that are controlled by the central executive. And then appears this episodic buffer. Okay, well, what is the episodic buffer and what is the, is the connection between the episodic buffer and the episodic memory? Okay. The episodic buffer binds information from different working memory, sources, and long-term memory. The idea is that 
episodic buffer is the place where episodes are formed, is the place where episodes are constructed from the sensory data that you acquire from the environment. Okay. Well, it's good, I understand. So we have episodic memory, we have episodic buffer, uh, and you talked about these uh, scene-based episodes. And I told you that uh, scene-based episodes are interpreted episodes. Well, if episodes are scene-based, how to generate high-level interpretation of what is going on in the episode? And for that, we need a theory uh, that comes from Garden Force conceptual spaces. Garden Force hypothesized that concepts like categories, properties, objects, and events have geometrical regulations in an n-dimensional space that he calls the conceptual space. And he proposes these uh, basic building blocks that are conceptual domains and quality dimensions. For example, I have this uh, uh, quality dimension of temperature that is uh, with, 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 with one quality domain. It's a concept, the temperature. We have another concept that is size that I have uh, two uh, quality dimensions, height and, and, and width. Okay. We can have a color domain, for example, where we can have uh, RGB or we can have different ways of having three uh, quality dimensions for this conceptual domain. And then I can create uh, objects and we can create properties using this. Okay. Uh, a property uh, can be a region or a dot in the domain space and an object comes as a bundle of properties. For example, uh, this uh, project, this uh, object, uh, Apple, uh, is something that uh, I have something in, in, I have a property on the domain of color, and I have a property on the domain of size, and when I put those together, I have this object, okay? Uh, Gardner Force also introduces us to the notion of action. What is an action? It's basically the perception of a change in an object. I am tracking this object and I'm looking how the parameters of this object change a long time. And using this idea of an action, he proposes this concept of an event. And an event is basically a, a kind of a complex action where you have an agent that has a force on another patient and we have after that a result. Okay? So uh, imagine that you have uh, a block, okay, and I am exerting a force in this block, and the result is that the block moves, okay, and this is an event, okay. So we have all the things that we need to create our scene-based episodes, okay. So what is the episode tracker module? From a conceptual point of view, the episodic tracker module implements this idea of Baddeley's episodic buffer, together with the visual spatial sketchpad, in the sense that it builds the episodes as they are occurring from the point of view of the agent. Okay? Uh, our model presumes that Tuving's long-term episodic memory receives the encoded episodes from the episodic buffer. So, the episodic buffer interfaces the information with uh, this long-term memory that is in the episodic memory, and the episodic representation should be similar in both systems. So, in this uh, particular uh, slide, we can see the difference between the episodic buffer and the episodic memory. The episodic buffer is the place where episodes are constructed. They are happening in the real present. Where the agent is connected to the environment, it's collecting data from this environment, and in the episodic buffer, which is a kind of a short-term memory, I am constructing these episodes. And once this episode is there, I can move them to an episodic memory that is a long-term memory, where I'm going to store all the episodes, and then later I can retrieve these episodes for use them, for example, for decision making or for learning or for whatever cognitive purpose I want to put on, on, on this episode. Okay. 
Well, uh, then comes our episode tracker representation. Our model uses a modified version of Garden Forest conceptual spaces for knowledge representation for object and properties. In some sense, I have presented in earlier BICAS uh, some uh, uh, ideas regarding how we, we are making this adaptation of uh, Garden Forest uh, conceptual spaces. Uh, we have categories uh, that um, I, I use to discriminate and to generate instances of, of uh, these uh, elements. We have F events and we have episodes. We have here, uh, I, I put here, for example, uh, two uh, examples for you to, to understand. Uh, the first one, I have an episode that um, is basically a sequence of events. Okay, so we have an event zero that in a time step zero has an object that has some property and some quality dimension that has some value. Okay? And then I have a, in a second time step, time step one, the same object will have now a different value for its quality dimensions. Okay? And uh, this is just one of the events and the episode by itself, it can have more than one simple event. This is one way that we can represent uh, an episode in uh, a scene-based way. Why a scene-based? Because in this kind of representation, you can clearly see the object, the properties, how they are the situations in these different time steps, and you can understand how this situation changed when time passes. Okay? And uh, there are a little uh, complexifications on, on, on this idea. Um, imagine, for example, that you are, you, you are trying to track uh, an episode where uh, an object is moving okay, in one direction. And if you are tracking time, it is always moving. Moving, 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 moving. But then it stops. For representing the event, I don't need to just uh, store all the movements because they are always going to the same direction. I can just capture the start of this movement and then when it stops, I know that it stopped at some point and then I have a very good representation for the whole episode. I don't need to store all the single steps that this uh, uh, object moved from one point to, to, to another point. Okay, uh, this is a way of representing it. Uh, there is an alternative way, for example, where we can just have for an episode many time steps and then I can be tracking everything. But in this case, maybe uh, I, I don't have uh, this uh, compactness that I can have if I just drop off all the changes that are not important or they are not relevant for understanding the, the system, okay? Well, uh, we have used that for uh, CST, okay? Uh, this is uh, CST in, in a nutshell. We have this idea of a codelet. The codelet is the process that is doing something important in, 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 in the system, okay? Uh, this is the memories. So I have codelets and memories, and CST basically creates architectures putting together codelets and memories, okay? Um, this is an example of, 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 of how things uh, work. And basically, a cognitive architecture is a connection between codelets and memories in some sense. And this is here for you to understand how the episode tracker uh, works, okay? Um, we have uh, this small cognitive architecture where we have on one side sensory data entering and on the other side uh, we have a chain of episodes that are, are going out. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to enter into the details of the architecture right now. If you have uh, interest, I can uh, give you a, a better understanding later on, on, on how it works. Okay. Uh, I will go for the experiments with, uh, that we have made with this uh, episode tracker. Okay? 
The uh, episode tracker module was implemented and tested in experiments using GPS data. This uh, GPS data was collected from smartphones uh, that were, was used as input to episode tracker. And members of our research group collected this data, commuting around the campus, uh, collecting data from latitude, longitude, the timestamp, and uh, this was made in a sampling of one hertz. Okay? The main challenge here is to detect the relevant space regions to be used as locations to describe movement episodes, and then we need to detect the relevant regions uh, where you stay during a significant amount of time that characterizes that it is an important spot. It's not so easy. There is a problem into that. Uh, different velocities while walking, jogging, or moving by car, by bus, small stops, uh, this can change how I can understand what is going on. Uh, a really relevant region should be characterized by a recurred return to that region in different situations, and two, different algorithms for detecting relevant locations were used, the pheromone algorithm and the mean shift uh, algorithm. I will ask my student, Eduardo, who participated into this uh, work, to please come here to, to give a brief explanation of, of these two. I will be uh, together with him here. Okay. So we don't have enough time, so I'll be really brief. So the pheromone algorithm was an uh, algorithm that we have altered, so we have created it. And the idea, it, it creates circular regions, and each of the circular regions that we have is composed by a group of circles. And if an agent, or the subject in this case, is inside that region, one of, at least one of those circles, so it's within that region. And the mean shift algorithm is a non-parametric density-based clustering algorithm. And the idea of it is that it not solves the issues that Ricardo has told, but as we must remember, uh, CST is a reusable framework, so we are using, uh, so we must use different algorithms for property category learners and not only the ones that we want. So different research groups can hypothesize and use different, uh, their different theories. And here we have the results with the Fermon algorithm, this one with the mean shift. We can go to the other slide because, so it, the episode tracker module could successfully uh, uh, so I've detect and describe when an agent has, the subject has entered, left, or stayed in a relevant e region, and also could successfully detect episodes when the subject moved from a relevant region to another. And we have a few limitations. I think the biggest one is that uh, it does not bind features into objects, and this is a mechanism that we see in animals and also in humans. But it is only considering, for example, each uh, latitude and longitude and timestamp values for a specific subject. But that doesn't happen. We must have mechanisms to uh, bind features together into objects. The second limitation, uh, it doesn't address uh, hierarchical structures of proper categories. For example, if we are in a, a specific laboratory building, it will not consider the room that we are working on. It will consider the whole building an important relevant region. And the last one is that it doesn't consider the pathways between moving from one relevant region to the another. So it considers going to region A and going to, from region A to region B as the same pathway, uh, despite of the, the pathway that it makes. So, okay, yeah, thanks. is this? Thank you. Perfect. Sorry for the time. <laughs> okay, so uh, we, have time I, for questions, we do. I've got one quick one. Okay. Um, so when I reflect back on on yesterday, I, I have the impression that I, I can see it, that you can ask me questions about um, something that I may not have paid attention to, and I can, it seems that I have the data. Is that, are you proposing that we reconstruct that? Yeah. Okay. So the, the idea is that uh, if we, uh, get a representation of what are the objects that are involved in the episodes, we will be storing that, we will be uh, uh, having some way of reconstructing that. So I don't need to uh, store all the things, but I can use this, as you said, to, to recreate these things. And for example, if I want to remember what, what happened to, to today uh, when I wake up, I will not have a precise remembrance of that, but I have some specific things that are important that I can use and I recreate a scene and I can give you more or less what happened during this, this scene uh, in, in, in that time, th that particular time. OK. 
Okay. Thank you. Other questions? If I'm, not, uh, if I'm not allowed, we can discuss later, maybe during the dinner time. It's fine. Just do one question. All right, just, uh, very quickly. So, uh, Ricardo, do you think it's possible to model the temporal relationships between different episodes in a most implicit way, like uh, without the check uh, module, uh, a more neurally plausible thing? In, in, in sense of time, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I believe that yes, probably. Uh, I don't have exactly a, a, a complete question, but we can discuss that later. All right, thank okay, you. I'll be glad to. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Now moving right along. Yes.